Show, a podcast for the fans. By this the is fans. the freaking frack show, a podcast for the, for fans, the fans by, by the, the fans. fans. Frack show, a podcast for the fans by the fans. All right, guys, <laughs> you're watching the freaking frack show podcast for the fans. for the fans by the fans. Well, Kayla, my man. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. How are you today, buddy? Uh, doing pretty good, man. I'm in the I'm in the big city of Houston, man. Uh -huh. What are you doing down there? I, I'm gonna pretend like I don't know. Tell the people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm over here actually uh, attending Comic Con, uh, Comic Palooza, and uh, eating some great food uh, for the very last time for a long time. <laughs> so Comic Comic Palooza, man. Uh, you you drove right yeah i i drove you know it takes four and a half hours to get to houston or four hours and it took like seven and a half because i was taking so many breaks with my back yeah uh, doctor said every 20 minutes take a break and uh i did <laughs> you know it was That's pretty awesome. crazy man how's everything yeah. going for you it's good man we just had a uh, state uh state finals uh, playoffs for uh my baseball team down in down in omaha and, and the kids fought hard and and we went to work and it was just one of those things but hey i want to i want to congratulate you before we bring our guest on on the 50th episode man 50th episode 50 episodes man 50 that's pretty that's a lot for uh, a year <laughs> It's a lot for two dudes that uh that just want just winging it, you know what I mean? Just going about it yeah. as as best we can. Yeah, because uh you know uh our story started you know not even a year and a half ago, uh you know, and it was all about uh our our love and obsession. Uh, for those who are tuning in, welcome to the Frick and Frack Show. Uh, we're all about the '90s to 2000s uh, boy bands, music, um, you know, singers, actors. You name it. Uh, this is this is a show for you guys. Um, yeah. We've been blessed to have some amazing guests, um, the people we loved, including the guy we have on tonight. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I was taken taken back earlier. I was actually uh, cruising the neighborhood in, in my uh, Toyota. Not that that's special, but <laughs> uh, you know, and I, I'd put on Summer Girls and I put on uh, you know Girl on TV, and I was just yeah. like. I remember doing this as a kid, except for I wasn't the driver. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's crazy, man. So everybody that's tuning in, uh, I know we're going to have some new people in the house tonight. We're going to have some familiar faces in the house tonight. But let us know where you're watching from, where you're dropping in from. It always blows our mind, man. We have people from Jakarta that watch this, we have Indonesia. We have people from all over the world, uh, you know, from one end to the other. And, and it's a beautiful thing, man. Let us know where you're watching from and let us know what, what LFO brings you back to? Because that, that fascinates mm. me. What where, where does it take you in time, right? Yep. Hey man. Yeah, it's dude, LFO, man, you know, LFO just takes me back in time in general. Yeah. Like I, I mean, I was I was a I was literally a kid, you know, when they when they start, you know, when they were on the radio and yeah, uh, when Summer Girls is coming out, you know, I was like, you know, at first I had a thought that oh this is 98 degrees for some reason as a kid they're that good they're that you know good. and i was like man it's just three guys doing this yeah <laughs> you know hey man this is uh the freaking frack show episode 50 this is a podcast for the fans by the fans and we are pleased and honored to bring you brad fischetti hey hey, hey. What's, up? What's, what's up guys those are some very kind words you guys were offering uh while i was in the backstage area <laughs> <laughs> hey man, honor, BFPs, man. man how you doing yeah. today buddy yeah i'm doing well That's so awesome, uh man. i'm glad you guys have a label on who's frick and who's frack yeah yeah <laughs> we yeah, got we, hats too. Had to. <laughs> yeah yeah oh uh, yeah uh, you get the hats too <laughs> we, we actually had to because people would always say so who's frick and who's frack and uh, yeah. i would freeze up and say um me too because uh, i'd always forget <laughs> yeah yeah me too man uh, man, we got we got people from all over the world tuning in, and then 
uh, thousands that'll watch the replay, man. So I, I just, you know, Caleb and I want to thank you for doing this. This is a huge honor for us and, and being on our 50th episode, man, uh, we couldn't be happier, bro. So thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for asking and thank you for helping to keep, uh, the music of the nineties and two thousands alive, man. That's it's, what we do. You know, I, I think honestly, there's a lot of important things in my life, but, uh, keeping the music alive, especially the people, who, uh, who changed our lives as kids, as young people, it's, it's on top of the list for, you know, important things of my life personally. <laughs> you know, that, we, we, that, and, that and driving around in Toyota, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause that was, yeah, man. <laughs> that caught me off yeah. guard too. <laughs> I mean, I mean, well, look, you, have, you, know, you had, you had vanilla ice and it's 5.0 and you're in your Toyota, <laughs> Toyota. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm really bringing shame to the game, right? <laughs> Man. No, that's cool, man. You know, I, you're being honest. It's cool. You could have oh, been yeah. like, yeah, so I was driving around in my uh, F-150 2020. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah cool, never, I was never a truck guy, man. I was always scared of trucks and uh, I was good at driving cars, man. <laughs> yeah. And man, we, we always talk about uh, the music that moves you and music that makes you feel a certain way. Uh, that's yeah. something that we can consider timeless. And, and I think it's safe to say the music that you you and your bandmates have helped uh, bring to the world, it, it falls right in line with that, man. It's timeless. It's something that never gets old and that that each time you hear it, it has a story behind it. Uh, yeah. So we want to ask you to help us tell your story first and then the legacy of LFO. So let's start at the beginning, man. Where are you from? Uh, how did you originally get into the get into the game? Yeah, so I grew up in a small town in New Jersey, a place called Mawa, which uh, some people don't even believe existed because it has a weird name. But uh, <laughs> it's it's really there. Actually, Bruce Springsteen put it on the map. He in one of his on his first album, he actually mentions Mawa because there there was a, a big Ford Motors plant there, I guess, in the seventies. But anyhow, I grew up in Jersey, uh, uh, rich. And, and Devin grew up in the Boston area, uh, rich outside of Boston and, and Devin in New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts, which is uh, famous for Devin Lima and Moby Dick. So uh, those are the two <laughs> most famous things about nice. New Bedford. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah. So, uh, you know, where I grew up, having a career in music wasn't something you really thought too much about because it was really just a small suburban town. Now, where Rich and, and Devin grew up, you know, Boston was a beacon for music, especially in the, you know, like the late 80s uh, with, with yeah. New Kids on the Block and New Edition. It became a real hotbed for music. And so, you know, I think Rich was really uh, as, aspiring to be in music. And, and, and so was Devin, you know, Rich as a rapper, Devin as an R&B singer. I was always yeah. into music. I just didn't really think about the possibility of, of pursuing a career in music until I was a little bit older. Um, you know, the, like I said, the group basically originated in Boston with Rich because Rich was like this teenager with blonde hair, blonde hair and blue eyes, and he was rapping. And they used to call him the light funky one because he was this blonde hair, blue eyed rapper. And, uh, <laughs> and that's really how the name started. Um, with, wow. with Rich as a solo uh, rapper. And, and, you know, back in, in the, in the you know, mid, late 80s and, and early 90s, it was kind of unusual for a blonde haired blue eyed kid from the suburbs to be rapping, you know what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> and even for me growing up in Jersey, um, being really into hip hop, it was just, it was kind of far and like, a, it wasn't, at least in the suburbs, it just wasn't that normal. So, I mean, I used to get made fun of a lot for, for like the way I dressed or the music I listened to, you know, but yep. um, anyhow, you know, Rich, one thing people don't really know about Rich, maybe they know now because I talk about it a lot, but he was literally one of the greatest rappers that, that ever mm. lived. You know, I'm not mm. saying that, you know, he would destroy Biggie, but if he, <laughs> if he gave yeah. him a beat, if he gave him a beat and a microphone, and Biggie would give him respect, and so would Eminem, and, and so would some of the greatest wow. rappers, because Rich was amazing. Um, so uh, that's how we started. Um, in, uh, in the mid, yeah, early mid-90s, Rich hooked up with another Boston rapper named Brian, 
And they, you know, they went from being a light funky one to light funky ones, right? And meanwhile, um, my brother worked for Lou Perlman's blimp company. Now, Lou Perlman was the guy who started Backstreet Boys. Oh, yeah. And, and but before that, Lou built blimps and, and, and had blimps like the Budweiser blimp and things like that. And so uh, my brother worked for his company in New York. And um, story goes, Lou was at a New Kids on the Block concert. I don't know. Let's just, I don't know what the year was. I'm just guessing 1991 or something. And was just amazed at, at the amount of people and the amount of money that was to be made and decided that, well, I want to start a boy band, you know, actually it had to be before that it had to be in the, in the, in the late eighties, because I remember coming down to Florida eventually they moved the operation from New York to Florida. And I came down to Florida, I guess I was about 16 and they had just started putting the Backstreet Boys together. So I remember just sort of, Wow. Uh, just, you know, get, you know, swimming in the pool with those guys and going to get pizza. Actually, Howie and I were just talking about that the other day. Um, Howie came over and and we had some lunch and we were just reflecting on that those early, early, early days in like 1991 where like, we were all just swimming at Lou's pool and, you know, just, you know, wow. nobody really knew what was happening. You know, the, the boys were rehearsing in a, you know, a blimp warehouse and it was just beginning. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, like I said, I'd visit Florida and get to know Lou, get to know the boys and see my brother. And then uh, when I got to be about 18. I was like, man, you know, I, I really, I think entertainment is, a, is the world I want to be. And I wasn't quite sure, you know, what realm it would be. And I was doing some modeling at the time. And so when I was about 19 or so, my brother's like, well, why don't you move to Florida? You know, uh, hmm. The Backstreet Boys are now over in Europe. They're making some waves, and we're just going to start an entertainment division of, 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 of these. Uh, you know, what was an aviation company? Yeah. So I, uh, I said to my mom, at the, I said, "Mom, I said, I'm going to move to Florida to be a rapper." And uh, <laughs> you can imagine how that conversation yeah. went. Yes, Meanwhile, sir, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like night. I'm like 19 years old. Live, you know, going to college and everything else, and so. Uh, it didn't go too well, but eventually she uh, she relented, and and I, I drove <laughs> to Florida. And uh, yeah. at the time, bro, I just uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. I just started working for Lou. I was driving his limo, filling up his you know refrigerator, running his errands, wow. just doing whatever I need to do as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. In the meantime, Rich and and the guy that was uh, you know originally with him, Brian had heard about what Lou was doing, drove to Orlando to meet Lou, rang his doorbell, and I answered the door. And no way. That's, that's, literally, that's literally how we met. And so, um, wow. you know, Lou was like, uh, you know, eventually he's like, you guys are into the same kind of music. You know, why don't you guys come together, you know, um, and, and be a three-man group? And so um, that's what we decided to do. Um, I'll never forget, we were sitting down there in Lou's game room and he brought out a guitar. And, uh, and I mean, keep in mind, he's got three rappers sitting in front of him. <laughs> and, he's, and he starts playing La Bamba. Oh. And, and he's exactly, like, yeah, oh. I, I sing, you guys don't know this one, sing this one. And so we're sitting there like singing La Bamba, which is like, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a good story to tell now. I, I, I tell that story <laughs> in this, this live stream concert that I that I did and we, uh, and we sang La Bamba. But, Anyhow, that's that's oh. how it started. Um, you know, we um, we we went sort of did the same thing the Backstreet Boys were doing at the time, rehearsing in the yeah. old Blimp Warehouse, and uh, and shortly thereafter, and um, Sync was in the mix, and they were rehearsing at the warehouse, and um, you know, we started overseas in 1996 and 1997, um, and we made some you know made some ways. We became kind of popular, but nobody would buy our records yet so we were like poor and popular you know <laughs> <laughs> i know the feeling <laughs> uh, yeah yeah <laughs> and then uh 1998 we had the chance to get released in the united states on a small label and, and made a little bit more waves um and then you know we just we just realized we'd sort of gone as far as we could go on a small label so we sat with lou perlman at, i remember it was the stage deli in new york city and basically we said lou listen we either need to get to Arista, RCA, or Sony, or we just we're just gonna break up because 
you know, just we've gone as far as we can go. Shortly after that, we had a breakup of sorts. Um, we parted ways with uh, with Brian and um, and David. Devin Lima entered the mix, and um, right after Devin joined, um, Clive Davis signed us with Arista Records. So that's yeah. uh, that's really when things started to take off, and, and that's that's the 1999, and, and you know what happened in 1999. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, let, let me ask you this. Uh, what did you, you know, in, you know, when growing up, what did you actually want to be? Did you always want to be a rapper? I wanted to be a baseball player, man. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Man. Okay. <laughs> okay. I respect that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Did, I mean, did, I, I never did it go I never, anywhere. No, nah, I mean, I still watch games to this day. Think I could probably do that. <laughs> <laughs> We all don't, do. Don't we all? Don't we yeah. all? <laughs> we all um, do, buddy. Yeah. It's so foolish, man. Yeah. Now, I, you know what I discovered is like a lot of athletes are want to be musicians and a lot of musicians are want to be athletes, yeah. you know? True. And, so, and, and also uh, actors, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, anyhow, yeah, you know, I again, I, I loved rap as a, as a kid. And my, I remember my brother was always fascinated with me rapping because, again, it was just weird at that time in, in the world for these mm-hmm. kids from the suburbs do rapping. Um, but I never really thought about the fact that you could make a career out of, uh, out of music. Cause nobody was doing that in my town. I grew up, like I said, in a small town, there was one kid who recorded like a, a demo on it. Yeah. You know, I remember seeing his tape, it's like a heavy metal band, you know, like, yeah. but that, <laughs> that was it, man. So, so it was kind of foreign to me at the time. So, I mean, th- this, we, we had Chris Kirkpatrick on uh, last week, right? A great dude, uh, humble, kind, very sweet. Uh, he had also hit on the Lou Perlman thing. And it was something that Caleb and I have never really went into, right? Because we've never, I mean, everybody you talk to about it, they all have their different story, but it all ends the same. Uh, sounds like you knew him a little better. Um, this might be an unpopular opinion coming from me, but the guy had to have had the right intentions in the beginning right i mean he without him we don't have a lot of people that we looked up to as a kid i mean yeah. what, what's your story on that man yeah you know um if you know i always tell people if they're looking for somebody to talk crap about lou or looking for dirt i'm not the right guy right you now. know um yeah this is not my way of doing things and on top of that he's dead and yep. um yep. can't defend himself so you know, Lou had his demons, um, and sure. unfortunately, you know, I, I said to I said it to his face one time. I said, "Lou, you, you could have had an empire, man, if you know, because what happens is and it happens at every level. When a band starts making waves, people start getting into the ear of the band that they can do it better, or they can get them a better deal, and 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 things of that nature. Yeah. And so, what Lou could have done was he could have stopped that at the pass and and went ahead and renegotiated some contracts to make them a little more fair for Backstreet and NSYNC and us and, and probably kept all of us under one roof. But instead, you know, we all had to fight and um, it was very expensive to, to sort of get things right. But, but you're right, without Lou Perlman putting millions of dollars into five unknown guys that became yeah. the Backstreet Boys, you don't yeah. have Backstreet. And then, you know, uh, and then taking what he learned and more money and putting it behind in sync, you know, you may not have in sync the way you see it today. And then yeah. again, putting putting a uh, time and effort and expertise and money behind three rappers, <laughs> you know, you might yeah. not see LFO the way it is. So um, certainly, he's he's made his mark in the in the music industry. Um, he's you know through uh, whatever scheme he had going on that defrauded people. He's made his mark in that world too. And that's very unfortunate. So he certainly has hurt a lot of people through his actions. Um, and he's also brought a lot of joy to the world. So it's, yep. it's a very, it's a dichotomy. It's a very, uh, it's a very odd situation for somebody to, on the one hand, have done so much good and on the other hand, have done so much bad, but you know, uh, I'm not his judge. Um, I, I just pray for the guy and, and, um, and, I'm thankful for, I try to focus on the positive, you know, I'm thankful for the opportunities yep. he gave. 
when he was on, he could be one of the funnest guys ever to be around. You know, he was a very, you know, a very joyful person in public. I don't know what it was like for him in the privacy of his own home all by himself. How, you know, when he looked in the mirror, what did he see? What did he think? I, mm-hmm. My guess is he was probably sad. He was probably lonely. Um, yeah. But, but like you guys said, without Lou, uh, it would be a different music scene in that part of the, that part of the world. So I'm yeah. thankful for the opportunities. And, um, and uh, I try to focus on, on that. But I'm not ignorant. Yeah, I I, yeah. I do know the pain. I do know the pain that was caused by some of his actions, and um, definitely, you know, again, I'm not his judge. Yeah, and and you know, the most important thing is uh, if you think about it, because honestly, you know, we talk about this all the time, how music moves every few years. Yeah. You know, one 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 three to four year span. You know, pop is the newest is the the biggest thing. And then all of a sudden it shifts to rap music for maybe a year, three years, four years. And, you know, I couldn't imagine, you know, where, where music, you know, would be today without, you know, the Backstreet Boys and LFO and NSYNC and I mean, new kids, especially, but, uh, you know, all these different people, you know, uh, would Britney be who she is? Like, you know, would she be on the charts, you know? And so it's, yeah. it's definitely important to recognize for sure, and, and here we are. Look at look at us here. Twenty years later, man. You, know, that's you mentioned a long Chris. Time. <laughs> you mentioned yeah. You mentioned Chris from Sync. I was with him this past weekend. Yeah, he's yeah. Part, he's part of this uh, Pop Two Thousand tour that I'm part of with O Town, nice. Mark, Mark McGrath, and Ryan Cabrera, and and oh, it's just like man. yeah, it's just it's such a beautiful thing when you see the fans like taking them back to a time when life was just a little bit more simple. Yeah, you know what I mean. You, you you really hit it because twenty years ago I was eight years old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was a young 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 kid, and uh, you know this this is the music. This is it. This is the music I, that was a part of me that will forever be. I think the best of me in in every in in a lot of ways because it it wasn't malicious. It was just great music that we can just bop to. We could dance to and. You know, there's there's something amazing when you go to, uh, let's just say a bar or a club, and they're playing, you know, you know all this new stuff, right? But then they turn on Summer Girls. Yeah. Then they turn on I Want It That Way in a bar in a club, and people lose their minds versus mm-hmm. the uh, versus the the new song of Lil Wayne that just came out. People was like, okay, but then <laughs> L- LFO comes on, and it's like. <laughs> I've seen it. I've seen it so many times, man. You know, m- the music that you guys made in particular, you know, speaks volumes. You know, like I said, 20 years later. <laughs> it's amazing. It really is. It's yeah. uh it's such a blessing for me to 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 be considered among uh those those days, you know, to 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 have an opportunity to be uh, part of a band that 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 has a song that lives on every summer, you know, um, every summer, <laughs> you know, the, it's just, uh, it's just really, uh, tragic and unfortunate that, you know, that I have to, that I have to be here to represent the bands, uh, alone, you know? Yeah. It's, it's really heartbreaking. Um, and in so many ways, man, cause, uh, we, we, it's like, we've, we've been through it with you, but of course you went through it you know yeah. and uh it's i want i want to say personally matt matt and myself especially like we're thankful that you're living on with the legacy of mm-hmm. lfo you know it means yeah, was the just, world it means the world yeah man. you know i was just talking to my wife about that right before you and i or we started talking you know she's like oh you know are you nervous and i said no no i'm not i'm not nervous you know i think uh <laughs> i think anybody who has seen um what i'm doing or what i've said over the last you know a few months or a couple of years knows exactly what where my intentions are you know what i mean Absolutely. and if you come if you come to a show that that um that i'm a part of or that you see the lfo name attached to mm-hmm. then you know for sure that i'm i'm not there to try to be lfo all by myself Absolutely. I'm there to to honor Rich and to honor Devin and to nurture the LFO legacy and to bring people back to a simpler time. And what you just said to me, 
that's what I just said to my wife. I said, the people are so mm. kind. They're so appreciative of, of those efforts. You know what I mean? So when you just said that to me, it, it brings me back to, to uh, you know, getting off the stage and then people just being so thankful. I mean, it's just totally, it's so humbling that they're so thankful to me for, you know, keeping it alive. And, and um, it's, it's what I call an unfortunate honor. You know, yeah. I, I, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish um, it wasn't this way, but it is. Yeah. And what am I supposed to do? Um, you know, sit in the corner and cry or, yeah. or try to keep the legacy alive and try to keep the memories of Rich and Devin alive and, and remind people of how talented and how special they were. And so that's my mission as far as, uh, you know, music goes and LFO goes is, is, is to do that. It's to honor those boys and to nurture the legacy. I mean, I mean, honestly, man, look, look at it like this, right? <clears throat> and who am I to talk about? It? I'm a, I'm a nobody, right? But li <laughs> I mean, from my perspective, I, I think what you're doing and, and the reason, you know, your wife probably asked, are you nervous? And, and why you ask yourself, you know, is, is this the right thing? Because this comes with a certain amount of responsibility, right? But, hmm. but to do it the way that you're doing it is you're honoring them, right? You're, you're going about this to keep the name alive to keep their stories alive a lot of people man if i'm being honest with you brad a lot of people could have hung it up step back and said you know what uh i i don't want to carry that burden i don't want to carry that weight yep. but you you did this in in such a certain way that you're right i mean watching the videos that we saw from last weekend it's yeah. like you're at an <laughs> lfo concert bro you're at an yeah. lfo concert and so i you know i without getting into the weeds of it and we're jumping way far ahead here but you're handling the responsibility the right way yeah. and perfectly and it can't be easy so thank you from everybody all over the world thank you i don't i'm sure you've been told it but i want to tell you again <laughs> thank you yep <laughs> yeah and and you know it's uh it's a beautiful thing because of course you know we, we've we've seen the footage from last week and you know uh every time you know o-town and such you know goes on the stage man it's incredible uh because yeah. We, we don't see Old Town. We, we, we see the three of you. You know, it's incredible, man. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it, man. It's, it's, a, it's a very emotional experience. And yeah. most, most nights I leave the stage and, you know, in tears. Um, mm -hmm. But the Old Town guys are, are like the perfect group to be doing this yeah. with oh, yeah. because yeah. They, they, they feel it. You know, they, yep. they were really close with Rich and, Rich helped them write songs and Rich's brother used to manage them. And then Devin, they just, you know, they knew Devin, but they, they really admired Devin's voice. And so yeah. um, for me to have the opportunity to honor the boys with the old towns together, Heck yeah, it's, man. Just, it's a perfect situation. And, and, you know, like I said, uh, being out there on tour and, you know, Cabrera and Mark McGrath and, yeah, and, dude. and Chris, <laughs> you know, like everybody's been so, so supportive and uh, so kind and, and the fans especially amazing so any of the fans that are watching right now just know that um everything you say to me every nice post you post it doesn't go unnoticed it doesn't go unappreciated um I, you know it, it really sort of fills my cup and uh helps give me the energy to uh to keep on yeah, man, it, it's a crazy fraternity, right? Like, isn't that a weird way to look hmm. at it? I, I feel like, yeah. like you guys, O Town, NSYNC, New Kids. It's it's a it's a fraternity in the sense that uh, people can say, "Hey, you know, I, I know what you, I know what you guys have went through. I know what you guys have been through." But being classified as a boy band is different. Being classified as a boy band, you have to carry yourself a certain way. And you said it from the start of this interview. You guys were three rappers, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's not you, you guys. You guys were all like the the Dannys and the AJs, right? But you were an entire <laughs> band of it. So mm -hmm. so kind of take me back to uh, to what kind of decided that? Like, how are we going to go and, and write Summer Girls? But you guys are three rappers, man. Take it. Take us back to to well, writing your guys. Yeah, first well, you song. know when Devin when Devin entered the mix, you know Devin was uh, he's a straight up R and B singer, you know. Yeah. And so that that changed our dynamic um, immediately, and then, and already before that we had added some singing into the mix just because you know we were over there in Europe trying to make it. You know what yeah. I mean? And so it's like you know we wanted to work with the same producers that the Backstreet Boys work with. Well, those are 
So, you know, those are different kinds of songs. Those aren't rap songs, you know? Right, right. So we'd already sort of stretched <clears throat> a bit and, and Rich started doing a lot more singing. Um, but yeah, when Devin entered the, the, the scene, it really changed the dynamic because he was such an extraordinary singer. So, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, Summer Girls, Summer Girls was released by accident, you know, and thank God it was because, Whoa, man. because you know, the, uh, the label really had a plan for us to be like a boy band. Like, and, and we were, looking back, of course, we were definitely a boy band. But the label had a plan for us to be like sort of a more like prototypical boy band. So yeah. some of the songs that they were planning on us singing, I think about one of those songs being released as our single, and I don't think we would have made it. So mm. Summer Girls, Summer Girls came out by accident. Um, it was a song that we had done when we were still on a smaller label, and the owner of the label, a lady named Kelly Schweinsberg, who has since passed away, you know, God rest her soul, because she she worked harder for us than than anybody I can think of. Um, she had sent the demo out to a handful of radio stations and, uh, one particular summer day, uh, mm -hmm. a, wash a radio station in Washington, DC was looking for a song to play and program director was going through some, some different tapes or <coughs> CDs, saw summer girls, listened to it, liked it, played it. Now, in the meantime, a personality from Z100, the biggest radio station on the planet yeah. in New York City, Greg T was driving through Washington, D.C. and heard it. And I was like, what the hell is this? You know, and <laughs> <laughs> calls, yeah. up the radio, calls up the radio station. He tells the story better than I could. But basically, like, he could hear, like, the DJ, like, like rifling through a box of CDs to try to figure out what song it was, you know. And then wow. he, track, he tracked it down. And then a week later, they like devoted their whole morning show on Z100 to Summer Girls. And uh, what I found out just recently when Greg was telling me the story is that Arista Records tried to stop it. They tried to stop them from playing it. But why? Why? I guess because it wasn't their plan. We had we had already we already <laughs> knew it would be on the record. Like we had already met with Clive Davis. And he had already promised that we could have it on the record. I remember sitting in Clive's office with Rich and Devin <coughs> and Mike Caputo. And, uh, and I was like, Rich, we got to play it for Clive. And Rich is like, no, 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 we can't do this. Listen, we got to play it for Clive, you know? So finally I said, hey, Clive, we got a song we want to play for you, you know? And uh, <laughs> Clive Davis's office is like this massive office with its own bathroom. He has like a butler. This is you know, at least back <laughs> in the day. So he yeah. pops it on the CD player and plays it. And he's like, oh, yeah, it's a good song. We'll put it on the album. And Rich was like ecstatic. He's like, I'm going to jump out this window right now, you know? <laughs> and uh, so we knew it was going to be on the record. It just wasn't planned to be a, a single. So, But mm. it just started blowing up from there. And thank God it did because it showed, uh, it showed the label that, A, we had a sound, and B, we could write music. Yeah. So that, gave, that, yeah. that sort of gave the freedom for us to, uh, to continue writing. So, our, so that, you know, the album was uh, sort of half songs they wanted us to sing and half uh, songs that was more uh, us. Yep. And that's phenomenal. Uh, you guys went the, the route of uh, during a time of like MTV and, and radio tours and mall tours, uh, MTV obviously being being one of the the biggest components of of the blow up. Um, can you talk about you know I mean did you guys do the mall tours? Did you guys do the radio tours? And and you know what were those like, man? It's a different time. Yeah, we didn't really do a tour of malls, but we definitely did our share of autograph signings in malls and and, and a number of performances in malls. Um, MTV, you're right. At that time, was was basically it you know it was like hmm. get on radio get on mtv and you're gonna be in good shape so uh yep back then it was trl you know that was like the yeah. show they came on at like probably what three o'clock or something four o'clock after kids were out of school oh yeah and they count down the uh they count down the uh top 10 videos of the day or whatever it might be and 
that's really where uh, a lot of bands were made um, on TRL. So it was a really cool time, man. And that was also the time right before Napster, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that's, you know, the year 2000, you know, NSYNC's record came out and sold 2.4 million CDs the first week, a record, you know? Oh. So that was a, that was a really cool time of music. And it, like I said, uh, 2001 is really when Napster started um, affecting the sales of, of CDs. And it took, took the record labels a number of years to actually embrace the, uh, the digital concept. But um I'm thankful, man. I look back, man. It was a cool time to be part of music, you know, uh, when CDs were selling and MTV was big and, um, and people were playing shows in malls and, you know, it was, it was, it was a good time in, uh, in entertainment, I think. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that statement um, because it, it seemed uh, not just a good time uh, for music, but uh, to us, the best time. Yeah. You know, in, the, in so, those short number of years, you know. Yeah, I told you Clive Davis has a butler, right? Well, my butler just brought me some water. Thank you. Uh, oh, look at that. Look at that. You, you'll be hearing about that butler. later. You'll be hearing yeah, about that later, man. She just said yeah. she's going to smack me. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it happens, you know? Yeah, it happens to me all the time. Man. Just, just a reminder that we're live. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, one, one thing I'd like to ask you, man, is uh, can you tell us about the writing uh, experience? when it comes down to writing the songs? Well, um, you know, typically for a, a group like us, we're typically writing to a track, right? So a producer would, okay. would create, create a track and when we write lyrics and melody, um, these days it's probably, it could be a slightly different just because over the course of our LFO careers, you know, we, we started dabbling more in playing instruments too especially devin devin became like a expert at almost every instrument he he really wow. became uh you know when we're jumping ahead a little bit but when the elf when we took our little hiatus in 2002 devin spent literally like the next five years in the loft of his house surrounded by music and literature wow. and and just learned to play instruments learned about all different kinds of music, read the entire dictionary. I mean, just <laughs> seriously, he just he just became like this music connoisseur. It was it was pretty extraordinary. But typically in those days, you know, uh, the producer would uh, to would give you a track and you just write to it. And and um, at that time, um, these guys, uh, Brad and Dow from Underground Studios, who I, I still keep in touch with. Actually, I just did a track with them not too long ago. Um, wow. those are the guys that did the track for Summer Girls and Girl on TV and West Side Story and, you know, really amazing wow. producers. And, um, in the second record, we got to work with, uh, these guys, Shep and Kenny, um, who did Every Other Time and Life is Good. And, and still today, Shep, uh, Shep works with a dude named Aaron Aceta and they've done a couple of big hits. Uh, recently they did that, uh, the best day of my life song, you know, uh, that yeah. was a big hit a few years <laughs> back. And so. Oh yeah, we've had a chance to keep in touch with those guys too. So we had we were really fortunate to work with some amazing producers. But but yeah, basically, the that's how it typically would go. You get a track, you would write to it, and um, you know, Rich was a very prolific, prolific. However, you say that word, writer. <laughs> yep, um, that one. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, that that word. <laughs> he uh, describes him. Yeah, yeah. I was talking to his brother the other day. He's like, Brad, you know, I have like a hundred songs that Rich wrote that never saw the light of day. You know? Oh, um, wow. yeah, yeah. So he was always, always writing, and um, just a uh, as you you can hear it in some girls. I mean, just what a beautiful yeah. mind, you know, to yep. to pen those lyrics. And and after mm -hmm. singing it for twenty years, it's still hard to remember everything. You know? Like, <laughs> yeah, for you me know. too. <laughs> yeah for uh, especially summer girls uh yeah. man i get tongue-tied twisted you name it man <laughs> rich 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 used to always forget the words on stage always, so <laughs> I, I was always backing them up and and, there you uh, go. and now i have the old town guys backing me up because sometimes yep. i lose my place and thankfully either the fans or the old towns will jump in <laughs> yep you, you don't you don't uh, have any worry <laughs> yep that's the part you sing. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's what that's what a lot of just hold the mic singing. out. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> For about fifteen words, then okay, I got it. 
uh so so we we touched on the writing experience man Let, let's talk about recording the music video um you know we're we're on a we're on a pretty good timeline here you know of where we're sitting i'd like to i'd like to to hear your experience of what that was like man uh for for any of them you picked the you picked the song what was your favorite music video to shoot oh some some of girls are definitely the <laughs> the most fun um yeah and i'm so thankful that for that video because it's really a timeless video it could have been shot today you know what i mean it just yeah they did they did a really nice job of of sort of capturing the vibe of summertime and summer nights and good times and, and just really just it wasn't real fancy it wasn't real flashy um it was just good sort of wholesome old-fashioned summertime fun and uh we had a really good time um making that video it was actually shot at coney island um yep. uh, in new york <laughs> and uh yeah, i could tell you another coney, coney island story as we get a little bit more into this but um we just had a great time, man. And, and it ended with a, basically a beach party, you know, the scene on the beach where there's like a bonfire going on. And at the very last scene in the video, I think Devin and I just ran into the ocean and just, you know, got ourselves all wet and had some fun, you know? There you go. Man. Yeah. I, uh, I've been to Coney Island quite a few times and, you know, Coney Island seems to be so famous, you know, for uh, new kids and, uh, you know, L LFO and, uh, multiple movies, you know, but, uh, it was why, why, is, of, why is it famous for new kids? Uh, new kids shot. Uh, what was it? What video was that? Oh. Not, 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 I'll be a love of you forever. Um, is it please don't go girl? I don't know. No, it wasn't that one. It was, on, it was in one of their videos. Where oh, they, so they, they shot they a video there. Out. Yeah. Yeah. They shot a music huh. video. I, one one of their cool. first ones. Yeah. It was a uh, one night. It was only. Memorable. <laughs> no. <laughs> but like it was so it was memorable for, for for that reason but uh yeah whenever i was watching the video the other day and as a kid you know you you know you don't really you you don't really think about it but looking back on the video it's like yeah you know it's cool whenever you've been there because it's like oh i was at this very same spot you know <laughs> mm -hmm. no that's that's true man when i, when I went yeah. back there in 2016 it was fun to sort of you know look wow. at the places where we had shot the video you know that's definitely cool. yeah and one of the most famous music video of, of the the whole uh decade man you know it's it, you got to have some pride there I, I i see it i hear it when you talk about it and that's that's cool man I, that, that makes me happy knowing that those memories it's, make you happy it's uh pride but also humbleness yeah you know yeah yeah i think uh this the story of what the song and the video meant to people is written daily when i speak to people like yourselves you know and you tell me you know like you you know you said it was one of the greatest videos of the decade well that never even crossed my mind you know what i mean right. mm. um so so you know I, the story keeps being written for me and it's really interesting to to hear from people who who lived it who uh, have great memories related to um our music so i really appreciate that Oh man, it's yeah. straight truth. It's for many people. It it is, and um, it's it's just incredible to you know because you do you do hear about these people, uh, and it's like they create these amazing you know whether it's an it's an album, it might be a single or three singles, and then you don't hear from them anymore. But it's been it's been all this all this time, man, and people still you know people still go to the concerts you know easily you know without any question I mean, we're looking at the comments and people are just like yeah, i'm going great. october 1st i'm going you know this oh that's cool but well, you know uh, i gotta it's incredible a lot of, you know I, you mentioned how some people have a single then they're gone but you know i yeah. like to remind people who think that we were one hit wonders i like to remind them that you know yeah. we had we were not we had a few hits and uh Yep. And, when, and I also like to tell people, people on Twitter, I used to troll Twitter and people, people would be like, oh, Summer Girls didn't make any sense. I'm like, no, but it made a lot of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah, man. I'm actually, uh, you know, all this time later, I'm actually going to my first LFO concert uh, in Houston. I'm going to, uh, I live in Louisiana, but uh, it's in oh, August. Yeah? I think it's in August. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. August something. Uh, I'll yeah. be at that concert, man. 
Oh, uh, sweet, man. Yeah, that's going to be at the House of Blues in Houston. Yeah, sir. Year. Let's see, 12th or 13th. Let me look. Real yeah, quick. I think, yeah, I think it's 12th, 13th. Yeah. Um, what is the date on that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm super excited, man. I'm, I've never seen O Town and I've never seen LFO. So this is, this is like uh, marking things off the bucket list. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> you know? Oh, man. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that's going to be, that's going to be a great show. Um, Houston is a, when you look at like Spotify, it's a good number for, for LFO yeah. or a good, good place for LFO. And sure anytime is. you can play, uh, anytime you can play like a house of blues venue, oh, yeah. you know, it's going to be, a uh, it's going to be nice. Cause they always have nice venues and, and the kind of place that artists would, would like to play in, you know, but that show you mentioned is on the 15th of yes, August yep. um, in Houston. And we'll be, uh, we'll be in Texas for the 13th and the 14th as well. One near Dallas and, one in a city called New Braunfels. So, um, oh yeah, yeah. You know, for any of those fans out there who are wondering, okay, well, when can I check out this Pop Two Thousand tour? When can I see, uh, you know, uh, this uh, opportunity to honor um, LFO? Just you know, LFO.me is the website, and you can find all the information there. But that's cool, man. I look forward to uh, to meeting you at, at that show. So you're in New Orleans, and uh, Frick, where are you at? I'm in Nebraska, man. You guys are actually coming to Council Bluffs, which is like. I don't know, t 45 minutes away. Oh. I do believe. Yeah. That, but yeah. like bone, bone thugs is on that one too. I don't know if that's the same, yeah. the same thing. Yeah. yeah that just sick. got, that just got announced this past week. It's going to be shaggy and TLC, oh. bone, bone thugs, yeah. 98 degrees, um, O town, um, and the whole like pop 2000 lineup. Um, Christian and sync guy from MTV. That's like a, Honestly, as that show was developing, I was like, "There's no way these guys are gonna pull that off." That's that, that lineup <laughs> yeah. is too gross. That lineup is too expensive. <laughs> I <laughs> am fired yeah. up, dude. That's like my entire childhood in one t in one show. It's crazy, Jeez, man. <laughs> well, here's That's, here's like a little known was... fact um, uh, that I only found out after it was announced, um, and that is the promoter deliberately chose artists that played that sweet stock show back in the day oh really and so all of wow. us have played it and if you go to their website i think it's sweetstock.com they have a little throwback video and there's clips and there's a little i saw a little clip of lfo playing that show in like the year 2000 so uh that's pretty cool i hadn't i didn't even know that and i, I think that makes adds a special touch that all of us played that show you know 20 years ago that is crazy that is crazy. Jeez. Yeah, and it's you know it's it's gonna be a I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm gonna have to possibly fly in for that one, Matt. Uh, yeah, dude, <laughs> that's, for sure. That's everybody <laughs> that you know, yeah. I've seen TLC uh, two three times, but like that's everybody you would yeah. want to see of the '90s and 2000s. Like that's that clears the list, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, actually, if I could speak for Frick. Um, based on what I can see, that's he would disagree with that. He would say you'd have to have the Backstreet Boys on that show to make yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But Yo. but you know you know that's true, and I absolutely agree, a hundred percent. But when you think of like everybody, you know, uh, you think of anybody but the Backstreet Boys. Yeah. I tell you what, that entire lineup is who we would name. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I, I went you know? through so many phases, bro. Like it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, we're 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 just gonna derail and get off topic here and just chat <laughs> chat it up. We got about ten minutes left with you, man. We won't hold you up for too much longer. But like going through my phases in life, you know, you're talking about Backstreet or New Kids, Backstreet, then LFO, mm -hmm. and and then all of a sudden you throw Bone Thugs and Harmony in the mix, like. Yeah. You're talking about the DNA that makes me, makes us up. Like, like when I say anything that moved me in any sort of way, that's good music, that's dude. It. That's good music. Yeah, no, I, I, I told my agent that um, the only way I'd play that show is if I got to rap Fuggers, Ruggers, Bone with Bone Thugs and Harmony. Oh, so. <laughs> oh <laughs> yes, indeed. Opportunity. It's the Fuggers, Ruggers, Bone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's going to be oh, wild. Oh, my goodness, man. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got to work on that. That's, yeah, bro. <laughs> we got to get that. I'm going to talk to yeah. my doctor. There I'm, you go. Uh, I, I just had back surgery, man. So uh, I'm going to talk to him and make sure he does uh, whatever, what I can do to fly, you know? <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, we'll have to. Uh, if not, I'll just live stream it with you right Let's here. Take the train, me. bro. Take the train. Oh, you know, man. So I got to travel the the United States for like three, four, or five years, and all I did was take the bus and the train everywhere, everywhere, and that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it comes right through, bro. It comes right through. Oh man. I'll check after the show. <laughs> all right. All right, brother. I, I want to talk about the documentary. Uh, I, again, we're, I know we're crunching on time, but I, I don't think it would be right for us to uh, not discuss it. Right. I mean, let, let's get into that. How did that start and and kind of walk us through the process of uh, and you know what? Let's talk about the emotions and, and everything that went into it, bro. Uh, you have the floor. You're talking about the LFO story uh, live stream. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess we really haven't gotten into um, why I'm here alone, right? And so that is uh, in 2010, uh, we lost Rich Cronin after a five-year battle with leukemia. Um, we had reunited in 2009 and actually went on tour. Um, and Rich was, you know, he was sick at the time, but well enough to get his footing in the center of the stage and, and rock the show, you know? Um, yeah. But... Uh, yeah, a year later, you know, I had heard that he was having some trouble walking. I remember this was probably uh, late summer, 2010. So I texted him. I said, hey, man, I hear you're having some trouble with your legs. So I figured the best way to get you out of bed is to book another tour. What do you know? What do you think? <laughs> I got no response. And then uh, mm -hmm. a week later, which was his birthday. I texted him. No response. And then a week later, I found out that he had passed away. So, uh, you know, for, for Devin and me, um, you know, we just sort of put LFO out of our minds. Um, Devin actually lived with me at the time and, you know, he was my best friend. Um, I put a record out on him on my record label called Devin Lima and the Cadbury Diesel, which is a really awesome pop record. I would encourage anybody who's, who's got Spotify or Apple music to check it out. And, um, and then in, in 2007, team we brought LFO back on the road and uh, it started because of a show at Coney Island in 2016 I was talking to uh, Jeff from 98 Degrees and he said hey you know we, we honor you guys during our set they were on the Y2K tour I said cool man I said well if you ever want you know uh, want us to come out there and do a cameo you know let me know and he said all right pick a date and so we noticed that we noticed they were playing Coney Island and so he said, well, what better place to, to, to play than where we shot Summer Girls video? So uh, we flew up to New York and we, we, we did our little piece. It was about 30 seconds long. Um, the crowd really uh, enjoyed it and uh, flew back home. And about three days later, I got a call from an agent who was at the show and asked if uh, we would consider bringing LFO back on the road. So something that Devin and I really considered and prayed over and discerned and and finally decided that, yeah, we would do that. And um, we hit the road in 17. Um, we uh, we brought a pair of shell toe Adidas to represent Rich. We had them hanging from a mic stand for the whole show. And we talked about Rich. And we sang a song that Rich had written about his struggle with the cancer. And it was a great tour. Fans were really supportive. And we were getting ready to book the next leg when Devin was diagnosed with cancer. And, you know, Devin was like the toughest, strongest, healthiest guy you could ever meet. So for him to be sick was just, wasn't really fathomable. And um, a year later, um, as he would say, he disappeared. Um, he told me yeah. towards the end, he said, listen, when I go, just tell the people I disappeared. <laughs> so uh, wow. in, in uh, November of 18, um, he disappeared. And for me, I said, okay, well, that's the end of that story, you know. Um, and to, to be honest, I went, I went into a pretty dark hole at that time. Um, it took a lot to uh, get out of it. And obviously, it's uh, through some, some medical help and through friends and family and church. And so I'd encourage anybody who's in the darkness to, uh, to seek the help you need to find the light. Um, yeah. And then... Uh, about a year later, my agent called me and said, hey, we got this Pop 2000 tour going on. And at the time, it was Aaron Carter and Ryan Cabrera in O-Town and Lance from NSYNC was the host. But there was some shows that Lance wasn't going to be at. 
when I like to come out and host a show and then do a little LFO medley uh, with Old Town. And I was like, wow, I never even considered doing something like that. And so um, I went out and, and, and then did it. And it went very well. And um, it's very, like I said, very emotional, but it went very well. And, and so then I was asked to do a couple more shows. And then basically I was, became sort of part of that tour. Uh, and then, and then the COVID hit and uh, there were no shows for 17 months. But um, like we talked about earlier last weekend, we were back on the road um, playing some more shows. And, and as we also talked about, uh, I'm out there to, to honor Rick, to honor Devin, nurture the legacy and, and bring people back to a time when things were just a, a little bit simpler. So um, the LFO story that you mentioned it was a live stream show where we told the story of LFO from 1974 to 2021 um, using the music of the time, the music that of the years that we were born, the music that influenced us, our own music, and personal stories um, throughout the uh, entire show. And it's it was done for a number of reasons. One, obviously, in honor of the boys. But two, I wanted to prove the concept because it's a show I like to play live. And so yep. I think sometime next year, um, hopefully we'll see that show pop up live in, in different places. Wow. That's a, uh, that, that, that can't be easy, man. I mean, th this entire thing can't, and, and I think you're, you're the guy to do it. And, and you know, we, we love you for it, bro. And I, I think, uh, I think what you're doing is great. I think it's brave. Yeah. Uh, and there, there's something before we end that I, that we ask every guest, you know, if you could go back and give yourself a piece of advice, what would that be? Um, you know, I'm not really one that, that uh, likes to like think about choices or decisions that would essentially change the, the present time, you know, because I think if you're happy with where you're at, then everything you went through was part of your journey. Um, oh. But, you know, it's something that we could have done that, that maybe it would not necessarily affect where I'm at today is, is we could have sort of been closer as a group. You know, we could have stayed tighter and continued on because we didn't, no, we had no idea that, you know, there would be this like time where nobody cared, which there was. The same thing happened for New Kids on the Block. Yeah. Backstreet Instinct is like, you know, there's this period of time where, okay, it's not popular on the radio anymore. And your fans mm -hmm. are too busy going to college and getting married and having babies. And it's just, you're not, you're not in the front of their minds anymore. You know what I mean? Um, and so it's like uh, you, but back then you think, well, it's going to last forever. You just got a number one hit in the country. You sell a lot of records. It's, you're just going to continue doing that for the rest of your lives. And, and it just wasn't the case. So I guess maybe if we could have stayed a little bit tighter and, and decided to ride the LFO wave a little bit longer, it might've been, a good choice and then obviously you know the way you handle money um yeah you know you, you know like trying to have mm. the the best sound system in your truck uh yeah. um, <laughs> probably not smart yeah. I, I, I wouldn't i wouldn't mind having that money back today you know what I mean? but, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah you live yeah. you live and learn man uh but you but you know what sir it sounds like you had a great life it sounds like you have it well it sounds like you have a great life um you know even through all the uh, the, 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 the hard times and hard things you went through, uh, it seems like it, every, like you said, you know, it's, you don't look back, you know, you try not to look back and see what the things you could change. Um, but like, you know, cause who you are, um, you know, what makes you who you are today is what you were like, you know, and what you, what you wanted to change for your future and become better. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you know, you know, obviously as you guys said, what, what I went through was tough. Now, in the grand scheme of life, it's nothing compared to what other people have to go through. You know what I mean? I, sure. you know, and I, I do sure. do a lot of do a lot of church work, so I get to see a lot of a lot of suffering. You know, um, so yeah. I can always sort of, you know, I can always uh, sort of gauge my suffering against what real suffering is. You know, um, but Most but certainly the things that go on in our own homes and our own lives are important in, in our world. But 
sometimes we have to put yeah. things in perspective too with the grand scheme of, of life and world and um you know it's uh it's been an interesting life though, to be honest with you man you know and the yellow stories to me it's a tragedy it's a tragic story um but sure. like i said before it's like all right what do you do with it do you just you just bury it and, and forget about it and, and and try not to remember the pain or the bad things that happen or do you um try to make something positive out of something bad you know I, what i always believe is through great struggle comes great grace right and so um, yeah. the situation you know i'm trying to bring something positive out of it out of it and um it's not easy honestly it's not it's like reliving it every single night you know um yeah but that's what i'm doing right now and uh, as long as people will uh invite me to play and my wife puts up with it i'll play <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we would love we would love to invite you to play here, man. Yeah, man, anytime. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, anytime you want to come on and just spit some bars, you know, uh, Heck yeah. you know, what well, even if we have a guest, we invite you just to randomly just pop on and just, <laughs> yeah. you know, and <laughs> especially like Jeff Timmons or something, because he's yeah. we've had him on. He's really really great. Yeah. Uh, you know, that would have been the perfect episode for you to come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's good people. Yeah. Yeah. I like Jeff Chang. Yeah. He's a good dude. It'd be fun. Be yeah. fun to be on with him. Well, maybe if you guys come <laughs> to the uh, Sweet Stock, maybe we can get a little backstage with uh, with, uh, oh, with Jeff. Man. That would Deal be pretty insane. Sealed. <laughs> Deal is sealed. My well, wife's got to go. Chinese food. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> That's my stipulation. You know, I don't know if I'm allowed to have a stipulation, but uh, you'd have to <laughs> what, share, what's share your an egg roll. <laughs> it's a We'd summer girl's stipulation. Uh, We'd have to have Chinese food backstage. Well, you know, I actually do that. I do a VIP, and it's Chinese food with bread. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible! Really? I Let's saw go. that's what my VIP. Yeah, that's that, yeah, wow. that's what my VIP is. We we go. I take I take like seven to ten fans out for Chinese food lunch. Anytime, <laughs> anytime. Bro, I'm in. I'm Frickin in. Frack edition. Anytime. Yeah, dude. We'll <laughs> we'll vlog it, bro. We'll vlog it and then uh, mm-hmm. let everybody in on it. Yep. Uh, All right, Brad, man. where where can uh where can people get tickets, man? What do you got coming up next? Where can they find you, bro? Yeah, like I said, LFO.me is a website and um uh, on the uh on the socials it's the real LFO. Perfect. Sweet. Hey brother, uh we appreciate you. Hang tight, man. Let's chat for a minute before you dip. Uh from Caleb and myself and everybody that's gonna watch this, bro. Appreciate the heck out of you. The, this this is this is great, man. This is a dream come true. Uh, thanks for the kind words. Peace to you. Peace to your fans. And uh, God bless you all. All right, man. For the fans, by the fans. Peace. Yo, it's the Frickin' Frack Show, a podcast for the fans, by this the fans. This is the Frickin' Frack Show, a podcast for the for fans, the fans by, by the fans. fans. Frickin' Frack Show, a podcast for the fans, by the fans. All right, guys. <laughs> You're watching the Frickin' Frack Show podcast. For the, for the fans, by the fans. Whoa.